Okay, so welcome to Thoracic Trauma Lecture Number 3. In this lecture, we're going to talk about cardiac tamponade, myocardial contusion, and traumatic aortic rupture. Okay, so cardiac tamponade. Cardiac tamponade is blood in the pericardial sac. And all that really means is that there is a fibrous sac that surrounds the heart. And between the heart and that fibrous sac, we get a filling of blood. So that sac fills up with blood and impedes the heart's ability to function correctly. So the signs and symptoms that we're going to see for a cardiac tamponade, uh, Beck's triad is the most commonly um, used uh, distinguisher of this um, pathology. And what you're going to see there is you're going to get hypertension, you're going to get distended neck veins, pretty much for the same reason that you have distended neck veins in the uh, tension pneumothorax. Um, the heart's ability to receive venous blood is impeded, and as a result, we get distension of those uh, jugular veins. Right. You'll get muffled heart sounds, and very difficult to describe muffled heart sounds, but it basically sound like normal heart sounds, but somebody's placed something over the heart, and um, they'll be they're kind of, it's kind of muffled. So um, how can I explain it that it's understandable? Imagine, imagine putting a pillow over the heart and trying to listen to heart sounds through a pillow. It's going to give you a very muffled sound, and that's pretty much the same thing. The reason you get that is because the heart's um, surrounded by a layer of blood, which is now in that pericardial sac. Right? So you'll get a paradoxical pulse, which means that your, your heartbeat and your pulse will not be congruent. So the heart will beat, and then you'll get a pulse style flow. Heart will beat, pulse style flow, and so on. So with a normal person, the heartbeat and the pulse style flow is congruent. They happen at the same time. Paradoxical pulse, they don't happen at the same time. Breast sounds are going to be equal, so that's a distinguisher, so don't get confused between a pericardial tamponade and a um, tension pneumothorax. Uh, you're still going to have those good breath sounds, bilateral, bilaterally equal breath sounds. And then your pulse pressures will narrow. And what pulse narrowing of the pulse pressures really means is that uh, the two pulse pressures creep up towards each other. So your systolic blood pressure will become lower and lower and lower, but because your blood, uh, your your heart's um, ability to receive blood from the venous circulation is impeded, your diastolic blood pressure will begin to rise, so, and those two will start to come together. Um, right, so pretty simple. Blood, uh, systolic blood pressure becomes lower and lower and lower, diastolic blood pressure goes higher and higher and higher. Okay, so here's a diagrammatic representation of a pericardial tamponade or a cardiac tamponade. You get those distended neck veins. It's difficult for the heart to receive venous blood, so they end up pooling, and the first place you're going to see that is in those jugular veins. We'll start to descend. Uh, you'll have blood in the pericardial sac, and this compresses the heart and impairs ventricular filling. So again, the um, heart's not able to receive venous blood. Your heart will try to compensate for that by going into a tachycardia. Well, the patient's heart will try and compensate for that by going into a tachycardia, but it doesn't compensate for the low, um, for the it won't compensate for the low output because the heart's not receiving a sufficient amount of blood um, for that compensatory mechanism to work properly. Okay, so the narrowed pulse pressures we've discussed that um, will result in low cardiac output, high central venous pressure. So we discussed the high central venous pressure and those narrowing pulse pressures and you'll get normal breath sounds and don't confuse it with, with a tension, by the way. Okay. So for a cardiac tamponade, uh, this requires surgical intervention, so we need to load and go with our patient, treat them for shock. If you're going to give fluid, you're going to titrate that fluid to 80 to 90 millimeters of mercury, uh, systolic, so that's definitely a systolic blood pressure, 80 to 90 millimeters of mercury. You don't want to overload these patients with fluid for all the same reasons that we don't overload patients with fluid in any other trauma uh, situation. You want to prepare for resuscitation so these patients crash pretty quickly. Um, you want to make sure you've got your ECG on, you've got your drugs drawn up, ready to go, um, you've got your uh, ECG pads on, and if you need to go ahead and start resuscitating, everything's ready to go uh, so that you're not caught um, unprepared for that, for that impending resuscitation. If the patient has uh, had blood trauma severe enough to cause a cardiac tamponade, then the chances are that they've had um, sufficient, that there's a sufficient mechanism of injury to cause a hemothorax or a pneumothorax. 
So keep your eyes out for those signs and symptoms of the hemothorax and pneumothorax as well. All right. Next, we're going to talk about myocardial contusion. This is a very common injury. It's usually as a result of blunt anterior chest trauma. It's very similar to myocardial infarction in that it presents similarly. So the same sort of uh, profile that you can get with a patient who's having a heart attack or, a, or an MI, you're going to see with a uh, myocardial contusion. So similar chest pain, you'll have similar similar types of dysrhythmias, so elevated ST segments, um, most common. Cardiogenic shock, it could happen, but it is, it is rare in these patients. And you're just going to treat it very similarly to what you treat a cardiac tampon. So don't go ahead and treat this like an MI. It isn't an MI. It's a different pathology. It just, present, it just presents the same as an MI. So you want to treat it as you treat a cardiac tamponade. If you need to give this patient a little bit of fluid, go ahead and give them some fluid. Keep it between 80, 90, 80 and 19 milli, uh, millimeters of mercury. So you need to really titrate that and make sure you stay in that 80 to 90 millimeters of mercury area. Um, you want to transport these patients to hospital as rapidly as possible, and you want to go ahead and prepare yourself for uh, resuscitation in case the patient crashes. All right. Finally, we're going to talk about the traumatic aortic rupture. This is a very common cause of death. 80% of these patients that suffer from this pathology uh, die almost immediately, um, within a minute or two of the injury occurring. Um, about 20% of these patients don't die, and that's usually as a result of the musculature around the aorta actually protecting the aorta or uh, preventing bleeding from the aorta. Right. It's usually as a result of motor vehicle collisions or falls from height, so where there's a rapid deceleration where the heart keeps moving forward, for example, and um, it shears away from the aorta, so the heart will keep moving, but the aorta stays in place. And as the aorta comes into the heart, the heart moves forward, and it ends up shearing that, that um, aorta. Okay, causes a lot of bleeding. It might not shear completely every single time, and those are the patients that you usually have a chance uh, to get to hospital. Wow. These injuries are difficult to identify, so you need to consider the mechanism of injury and your windscreen survey. Um, super important for raising your index of suspicion for this. So if you note in your windscreen survey and your mechanism of injury that this patient has suffered from a um, rapid deceleration, uh, force, then you need to have uh, the chance of a traumatic aortic rupture in the back of your mind. Right. Get these patients to hospital as quickly as possible. Um, they're definitely going to need surgical intervention to sort them out. Um, you want to treat these patients symptomatically, so probably not a good idea to push their blood pressures up. Again, you want to try and keep your blood pressures between 80 and 90 systolic, so hypertensive resuscitation. Um, make sure that you're ready to resuscitate. Make sure that you have your ECG in place, that you have your ECG uh, pads on, and that you've drawn up um, your, your medications in case you need to go ahead and, and resuscitate this patient. All right, that's it for lecture number three. We'll have a final lecture for thoracic trauma, and then that'll be it for thoracic trauma.